Holy Gospel is a reading from the Gospel of John, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And when Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. And it was about four o'clock in the afternoon, and one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. And he brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Well, when John spoke these words, John the baptizer spoke these words, look, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It had to have been a startling announcement for John the baptizer's hearers. In the King James Version, this is where we get the word behold, John the baptizer says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's as if John the baptizer is saying, Look now to this Jesus who is the Lamb of God. He will take away your sin and He will take away the sin of the world. Behold Him. Look to Him. Watch carefully stop your life and see, linger, reflect on Him, simmer and soak in this one's presence, the one who is the Lamb of God. Come and be close and contemplate and draw near and dwell with this Jesus. Walk with Him, be with Him, sit at His feet and and learn from this one who is called the Lamb of God, behold Him, look to Him, behold, this is the Lamb of God. He is not the victor, but He is the victim, the Lamb of God, woundable and accessible and vulnerable. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, behold Him. He is the the Lamb of God who dies rather than kills. The Lamb of God who forgives rather than condemns. Uh, The Lamb of God who heals rather than wounds. The Lamb of God who serves rather than controls. The Lamb of God who is humble rather than arrogant. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Your sin, my sin, the sin of the world. Behold Him. This is the great invitation 
of John the baptizer for all of us. Now how does this Lamb of God take away the sin of the world? Well, we don't know in many ways it is a miracle. Certainly that He can take my sin away is a miracle. That He can take your sin away, it is a miracle. But we believe that in some remarkable way, Jesus Christ does take away the sins of the world. And then we can join in this ancient, ancient prayer of the church, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on me. Tomorrow, we will pause and with the rest of the country, we will give thanks for the life and the work of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. We give thanks for his heroic leadership. We give thanks for this incredible dream that he left behind, a dream that we all are recipients of. It is a great dream that took on the evil of racism in our country. He led a movement to march across the ways of injustice while the chaos of beatings and fire hoses and police dogs were swirling against him and the African-American people. And the movement, his movement, just kept marching on even after he was killed because he had this great dream and he was able to bestow this dream onto many others. He knew what this dream would cost him. It ultimately cost him his life, but that movement, that dream remained undaunted. And that dream became our dream. That dream became the dream of our country. That dream became the one that we celebrate tomorrow. A dream given to him by God. A dream given to him by the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The world is in no doubt different today because of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The world is different because of God's dream that God gave to him and we all live in a better world because of him and because Dr. Martin Luther King was able to see God in the chaos and the conflict of his time. But the world is still in conflict. This did not take the conflict of the world away. Conflict is everywhere. Conflict remains in the Middle East. Conflict is in Afghanistan, in the Sudan. Conflict is in Pakistan, in Nigeria, and Syria. And the list goes on and on. Conflict is everywhere. Conflict is in our families. Conflict is in our schools. Conflict is in our workplaces. Conflict is in our government, in our churches, in our denominations. Conflict is everywhere. Conflict can oftentimes even be found in our own hearts, where our hearts are torn apart by the work of guilt and grace. And so we still live in a world of conflict. According to the Bible, the conflicts of the world began as soon as Adam and Eve left paradise. And from that chapter, the very next one, we hear of one brother rising up against another brother. And there the conflict began. And if you read Scripture, all throughout Scripture, we have the conflict from the very first conflict that was in the Garden of Eden when Cain killed Abel, all the way to the book of Revelation where we hear of the Armageddon. So don't think that the Bible just contains a few polite teachings about peace. 
The Bible indeed is about conflict from the movement of Adam and Eve, from the time that they began to reach for something more than what they were created to have. God himself has been in conflict with the world, a world that has lost its way. And so it is into this very conflicted world that John the Baptist came and started preaching. Look to, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, this one, this Messiah, that John the Baptist was pointing to, the true light of the world, he is the one that can take away the sin of the world. He can take away your sin and my sin. And so John the Baptist pointed to this one, to this Messiah. He was not the light, but he pointed to the, the true light. So when Jesus walks by in this morning's gospel lesson, John the baptizer points to this Jesus and, and he says, this is the one that we've been waiting for, not me. This is the one that we've been hoping for. This is the one that we've been yearning for. This is the one that we've been waiting for. And not just the disciples of old, the two disciples that are depicted in the gospel story, but to you, the disciples of today. John the Baptist points to this Jesus in our conflicted world and says, Behold the one who takes away the sin of the world. He's the one that you're looking for and hoping for and yearning for. And so the gospel lesson tells us that two of John the Baptizer's disciples who were following John the Baptist, they all of a sudden kind of peel off from him and they start to follow this Jesus. Andrew and another guy that were not told his name, they just peel off from John the Baptist and then they start following Jesus. They immediately, they just take off and, and they start walking behind Jesus. And I, I don't know, maybe they hoped that they wouldn't be noticed by Jesus. Maybe they kept their distance because they didn't really want to be a spectacle in their following. Maybe they wanted to be anonymous in their discipleship. Maybe they didn't want Jesus to know that they were following him. But Jesus stops and he turns his heels around and he looks at those disciples and he asks them a question. A very profound question. Jesus turns to these two and he says to them, what are you looking for? What are you looking for as you follow me? And it's as if those words just kind of remove themselves from the pages of Scripture and they come into our world and they come into our life so that we can hear Jesus as we follow Him ask us the same question. What are you looking for? It's not a rhetorical question. Jesus wants an answer. What are you looking for in Him? What are you looking for in this one who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? What are you looking for? And I kind of imagine the, the two disciples, they're kind of scratching their head and they're trying to think of a good answer to this question of Jesus because he's the Messiah, he's the teacher. We better have a good answer for him. And the one disciple just simply says, um, well, where are you staying? And I can imagine they, 
the other disciple hear those words blurted out of that other disciple's mouth and he, he just kind of puts his hands in his face and he's embarrassed for him. I mean, what kind of answer is that? You can't answer a question with a question to the Messiah, the Lamb of God. What are you looking for? But the great thing about this text is that Jesus does not chastise this disciple for this poor answer. He looks this disciple in his eyes and and he says, you come and see. And then he took the disciple home with him. Well, what is your answer to the question that Jesus asks you? What are you looking for? You might have a good answer. You might be looking for justice like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was looking for in his life. You might be looking for goodness. You might be looking for maybe just the ability to find yourself in your conflicted world. You might be looking for forgiveness. You might be looking for health. You might be looking for wholeness. So you might have good answers, but like this disciple in the story, you might have a poor answer as well. Maybe an answer that comes out of your anxiety. Maybe an answer that comes out of your selfishness. Maybe an answer that comes out of your own sin. But nonetheless, Jesus turns to you and he says to you, come and see. And you get to go home with this Jesus. Jesus takes you home with him when you take seriously this question that Jesus asks you today. What are you looking for in life? What are you looking for in your conflict? Jesus says, come with me and see. And he takes you home. And being home with Jesus is the only place where we can find our true selves. Being home with Jesus is the only place where we can find what God is like. Being home with Jesus is the only place where we can find what God is calling us to do in this life. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? Let us pray. Oh God, we pray that you would give us courage to walk through this life as your disciples and we pray that you would set your eyes upon us and that you would bring us home with you so that we might see you in all of life, even in our conflicts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.